Live right now. We are on air. Rather than you say, run air. Um, if you want to take a look at the viewing area, so you got a kind of picture of where you stand so you're on camera. Okay, so just to the left of Steve a little bit. So right here. Yeah, no, yeah, you're plenty, plenty good. If you're I'll be over I'll stay over there. Probably easier. Yeah, you're, you're, you're like hedging it right there. You're like half off, half now you're fully on. Yeah. If you do one side, I'll be on the other. <laughs> Yeah, it's all it's pulled right from the camera to the mic. So as long as you talk at the camera, you should. Be and I keep there's a little volume meter and everything we're saying for us. Yeah. Steve, you just want to take a look so you know kind of the box where you need to stand in to be on camera. So pretty much anywhere inside like the fireplace to the screen and well I wasn't planning to <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah as long as you're here the screen you know. <laughs> and we are live right now. Everybody come on front, have a seat. Hi, Steve. Hey, Steve. Good, are you? <laughs> Can everyone have a seat, please? I'm told people need to be in about 12 places, so, uh, which is fewer than some days. So. Welcome to our first catch forum. I hope a few more people come in. But what I'd love to do, as we do at the start of these, is to ask people that be kind enough to introduce themselves for everybody in the room for, you know, let everyone know where you have children and those things. And Beth, if you would, oh, actually, I'll start with Sue. Would you mind starting? And we'll, and we'll come forward. I'm Sue Mannix, Director of Marketing Communications, and we have some who graduated last year. <laughs> but, uh, Laura Mitchell, my daughter Diana is in third grade. Welcome. Lisa, would you mind just? Hi, I'm Lisa Brand. I have two boys, <clears throat> seven and 12. I'm Alex Taylor, and I have three children, grade uh, six, four, and two. That's great. Courtney Bailey, I have five boys, um, grades two, seven, eight, nine. Why do you always look down when you say that? <laughs> 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 I, just, I, just, I, just, I just have to think about what grades they're in. <laughs> Sharon, <laughs> would you mind introducing yourself? Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> um, Cheryl Durham, uh, we have four children, uh, senior, boy. Porter, um, Jackson and Elizabeth, twins in 10th grade, and a girl, Emma, in 8th grade. Hey. Yes. Um, Betsy Black, Social Director of Development, and I have two boys in 5th and 8th grades. I'm uh, Becky Brayman,
Uh, I'm Melissa Bergen, and I have a daughter in sixth, Katie, and a son in third, five. Stella Thorogood. Um, my son Owen is a new transfer as a junior to the upper school. Great. I have two little boys. Welcome. Raise your hand. I have um, a sophomore. What? Thank you. Well, Tammy Morbido. I have a senior daughter. <laughs> Elizabeth Norris. I have uh, three boys, seventh, fifth, and uh, first grade. Jody Dumas, I have two girls, fifth and tenth grade. Uh, June Levy, I have a daughter who's a junior, and then two boys, eighth and fifth. Sneel. Sneel the Kiara, my daughter is in seventh grade. Amy Clemens, director of enrollment, and I have a son in second grade. Adam Boyd Tavis, uh, CFO. Uh, I have uh, Nick is in a junior, <coughs> he's a junior, and uh, Lexi is in seventh grade. Great. Margaret Fence, two my head of upper school. Shane Kinsla, head of the middle school, and my son Charlie is in kindergarten. Chris Farr, director of development. I have two boys, uh, Keegan, who's a senior, and Henry, who's a junior. Jim Lightman, head of the lower school, and my daughter Chloe's in pre K. <laughs> Steve Phillips, it's my pleasure here. I'm told we're now live and we're online, so we have to be really careful what we say. <laughs> no, actually, it's exciting to be able to do that, to take it to the world. A nice cross section. I'm happy to see that. The front is still empty. <laughs> Here's what we're going to do this morning. And uh, heads forms for those who who uh, are new, I give an opportunity for lots of Q and A, but also to cover topics that we think are relevant and important. Uh, so for today's heads form, a couple of things. I'm going to ask each of the three division heads just to share one thing that might be exciting within each division. And if you have a question or two, you might be hesitate about that. And then I've asked uh, Chris and Adam to be kind enough to take us through where we are with the building project. Um, in case you don't know, there's one going on on the upper campus. Uh, and then they have some Q&A about that, <coughs> an announcement about that, and really some implications for us at the end of the year. And then we'll open it up to uh, questions and answers, observations. I hope the start of the school year has been good for everybody here. But it wouldn't surprise me at the very least if there are some questions about any number of things. Okay? Does that make sense? So, Tim, would you mind taking a shot and sharing something? You have to be. Hold on, what's the big way Travis go? We can go from here to over here, and we're still on. You're good right there. Okay, so I have to stand in front of that. Good morning, everyone. So, there's a lot happening in the Noah School, obviously, when you the math curriculum. Advice the Spanish program. There's a lot of students and teachers are doing exploring technology and using it to enhance learning. But having come from a student council meeting yesterday, what I'm most excited about at the moment is the opportunity next week for our low school student council to meet with Grant Lickman. And I just want to ask how many of you know who Grant Lickman is and that he's coming to the school? Everybody should raise your hand. <laughs> well, for those of you who don't know, Grant Lickman is an educational thought leader, and he's working. He speaks all around the nation, talking about school change. And he's coming to Shipley next Thursday. He's going to work with the student council in the lower, middle, and upper school. He's also going to speak to colleagues and to parents in the evening. And um, I met with the student council yesterday. And we had a whole conversation about it. We watched a short TED talk that he did. And so I'm really excited about that, and so are they. And I would ask, if you do come by the lower school in the next few weeks, stop by in the lobby and read the um, speeches that they wrote and that they read to their classmates in, in the process of being voted on to the student council. I think they speak to what we talk about when we talk about compassionate participation and leadership. I think they um, optimize what we mean when we talk about that. So please, please stop by and check it out. Thanks. Questions on that? So by the way, Grant Lickman will also be here on Wednesday. He's doing a, actually a, a presentation for ADVIS, which is the Advancement of Delaware Valley Independent Schools. There'll be about 200 people here on Wednesday afternoon hearing him and John Fry, who of course is a president at uh, Drexel University and happens to be a parent and a member of our board of trustees. They'll be presenting to a lot of schools, and Grant has been good enough. Uh, to stay over on Thursday to work with our students, present to our faculty and to our parents. And anyone who can make Thursday night, I think it's something we really are thoroughly Shane. Uh, so good morning, everyone. I'm going to do 
No, let's see about and then talk about three different things. But we had our rolling <laughs> 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 when when does three equal one? This is the math program that Tim's talking about. <laughs> so we, we had our transition night for fifth to sixth grade uh, during the weekend. I was talking to one parent and they they were sharing sort of their impressions of the sixth grade program and I said, Oh, I didn't know about the uh, one of the projects which is the chair project. So I want to give you three little things to go home and talk about if you have a sixth, seventh, or eighth grader. Sixth graders are doing a little test right now where they're doing swabs. Uh, they took swabs from all over the body to see what part of the body had the most bacteria living on it. So there's little petri dishes. I'm passing on that one. Side side. So you can ask them about where they think that the most bacteria lives, and then they're doing that right now. But again, it's, it's a really hands-on fun experiment. They're using the microscopes to look at the bacteria as it grows. So sixth grade science is really, really interesting. Seventh graders, if you have a seventh grader, just come back from DC, but they're bringing in their memorials right now. So when you're in the building, even if you're not a seventh grader, come in and visit the seventh grade floor at conferences and you'll see all these memorials left out on the seventh grade floor. Can I stop you for one sec? For those who don't know, the seventh grade spends the day in Washington and among other places visits the Holocaust Museum and this is what the memorials is all. So it's a really wonderful project, it's very creative and it gives the students to express their full understanding of the Holocaust in different and unique ways. And then the eighth graders, I got in to see the eighth graders giving their book reports this week. So if you have an eighth grader, you can sit down and ask them about the book report that they presented. And they were really doing analysis of the book. It wasn't so much of, I read this book, and this is what it said. They were looking at the theme and sort of the, the metaphors that were used, sort of how, how does the author got the story across, what they felt about it. And again, it was an interesting way for them to present on their thinking. I encourage you to sit down and chat with them about it. They'll be blown away that you seem to know how do you know about my sixth grade or my eighth grade book report. But again, they're worth looking at. So some conversational starters for the week. Thanks so much. One of the things I like about the <coughs> that she chose, you really on some level speak to the commitment in terms of both interdisciplinary and integrated curriculum. This has become so fundamental to the school from really from pre-K through grade as well. So that's exciting. More. Like Shane, I chose to uh, interpret. Uh, I'm doing a hell of a job. <laughs> Steve's invitation to talk about one thing. Um, it was so hard for me to choose. So, uh, what I'm really going to say to you is I chose to innovate um, because that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about innovation in the upper school. And innovation is either taking something and um, that exists and turning it on its head or starting from scratch. A lot of times in education, it's actually turning, uh, taking something as it is and turning it on its head. And I want to give you some really uh, exciting examples of that. So I don't know if you're familiar with David Rich, but he's our classics teacher and he's been here for about 20 years. And he's just such a wonderful example of someone that has one foot in Plato's cave and the other foot is uh, firmly planted in the 21st century. So he gets to both places and yesterday he, uh, he brought a, a group of us together, include, am I standing in the right place? You're fine. Okay. <laughs> um, so he brought a group of uh, <coughs> students and uh, administrators, teachers together to show us something that he's been working on. For a long time, he has done these translation exercises where uh, they've been pretty much static. He's always used electronics, but he has changed it into a Google Sheet. And uh, it is, he showed how it works in the class, and he is just so excited about where the technology has brought the class. But the really marvelous part is as he's telling this story and, and the, the work and translating is going uh, on right there, he said, the first time I launched this, we were in class and we were working, and I had a young woman who was out for, um, sick. And, at, and I don't know if you're familiar with Google Docs, but the names of the people uh, who are in the document at the time show up at the top. And all of a sudden, lo and behold, um, the young woman who was sick in bed had um, <laughs> logged in, and there she was translating her part um, of Cicero or wherever they were. And that, that to me, is just a, a wonderful example of creativity and collaboration, and that's what you're going to see in all the examples. I don't know if, uh, if you have students in the upper school, if your child came home and told you about the Marshmallow Challenge. Mm -hmm. And some of you, when you hear about the Marshmallow uh, Challenge, may think about Carol Dweck's work and the, the whole idea of whether you can wait persistence uh, for a marshmallow. This is a completely different Marshmallow Challenge. This is where uh, all the advisories got uh, 
20 pieces of spaghetti, a yard of masking tape, a yard of string, and one marshmallow. And they were not allowed to eat, pull apart, mm -hmm. do anything with the marshmallow, and the marshmallow needed to go on top of the structure, and they needed to build a structure, the tallest structure that they possibly could. And uh, those were their instructions, and every advisory did it, and it was wonderful to just watch the creativity and collaboration, how the students work. If you talk to your child about it, and also go online and look at Marshmallow Challenge, and learn who does better, MBA, student, uh, MBA students or, um, yes, or um, kindergartners. Um, we don't have a lot of questions about that. <laughs> but by the way, we're not using that approach to building the building. <laughs> no, um, no, and that's a good thing. Uh, and then um, in the classroom, uh, another example is in our, uh, we have Chris Bernaro who has come in to uh, Shipley this year to teach engineering, robotics, and math. And in his engineering course, he has been collaborating with uh, John Zellick and using the Innovation Lab, which has a 3D printer, among other things. And the students were all challenged to make a chessboard. And uh, each, the students were divided into group, and each needed to make a piece, which they needed to design uh, so that it could be made through the 3D printer. And the 3D printer designs from the bottom up, which means if you are making a penguin, which is a group, some penguins for ponds or a pagoda, um, they, um, you really have to think about how it would um, work. And I happen to be in on one of those classes and be able to see the thinking behind that. And lastly, um, just community, creativity, collaboration, all involved. The senior class um, looked at a, a challenge that they had, how to raise money for prom. And it's been, it, every senior class approaches it, and it usually translates to a lot of baked sales, a lot of cupcakes, um, and not, not as much money as they might like. So they reimagined it, and on Wednesday night, they pulled off the first Senior Follies, which um, had a $5 admission charge, which got you um, admission to the event with lots of good music and amazing things happening, um, pizza and baked goods. And they raised, uh, I think, $350. And uh, it was just a smashing success where we also saw some students uh, with talents that we didn't know about, um, <laughs> Uh, pianist, singers, uh, viola player. It was really a wonderful night. So that's what's happening in the upper school. Thanks. So the truth is, is that the ball speaks to a lot. Of, there are a lot of talents we don't necessarily know our kids have, and that you may not know your own children have. And it's one of the reasons we're as committed as we are to the whole idea of having to learn how to take risks, how to slip, how to fall. First in areas where they're more naturally talented, but then in other areas because you get to see some of the things that Margaret spoke to. And the piece about innovation, of course, it, it's fundamental. If you get to hear from Grant Lichtman, that's a significant amount of you know, the discussion. It's about how do we do what we do better, but, but differently. Uh, and he's visited schools all over the country, uh, and we'll have some wonderful insights associated with that. And of course, that's part of what is at work for us as we can reduce one to one and do other kinds of programs as we're thinking about our kids over the next generation or two. Fundamental to our moves in that way, of course, to become what we're doing from a facility perspective to be able to meet those needs. And I've asked Chris and Adam if they'd be kind enough to just take a few minutes to take us through that. Thanks. Steve. Everybody remember what this is? <laughs> this is groundbreaking last June for our new Student Commons and Arts Center. It was a great day. And uh, we're really excited that uh, progress has taken place on the construction up off of Montgomery Avenue. Everybody, I'm sure, has seen it. Um, and so this morning, what uh, we thought we would do is just take you through a summary of what the plans are to start with. I want to share a video with you. Um, then Adam will talk about some specifics regarding dates and milestones uh, for these projects. Uh, and then he has a video to share. And then there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. So. Let's get started. The, uh, the plan, this is ultimately um, in about 12 months, a little over 12 months, what uh, the upper campus will look like. Uh, there are two things that are really going to be happening here, and the sequence is important. Obviously, the construction you see happening on the upper campus right now is, is in this area. And uh, this is where the tent was during groundbreaking. Uh, and this will be the site of the new Student Commons and Arts Center. Um, so we're building that facility first, 
And then what we'll be doing off of the main building is actually taking down both the dining wing and the kitchen wing next summer as this facility is completed. And we'll be transforming that whole area and building another addition on it to become our new multimedia library and academic resource center. So the ultimate plan here is that you will have this area really becoming the social hub of the upper campus, this area really becoming the academic hub, and we complete the quad. And we're excited about, excited about the possibilities there. So a couple of things before I move on to some renderings and then share an animation with you that I want to point out. There are green elements to the new build, building. So atop the art center, you will see these solar panels. And uh, they, um, I'm led to believe, will be able to provide 65% of the buildings uh, at maximum energy, is that correct? Uh, with the ability to uh, actually sell back to the grid. Is that right? Absolutely. Um, and then another element of this roof is um, rainwater and being able to uh, capture the rainwater, it will be transferred to cisterns, which are actually located over here, and pumped back out as um, that, that, able to rewater the lawns around the area. So um, we're excited about those elements. Also on the new library, the roof, we will have a green roof. So uh, these are some nice uh, green elements of this, the buildings. The new facility here, the Student Commons and Arts Center, we are anticipating being a LEED certified silver at this point. So we're excited about that possibility. Um, just a couple of renderings in a moment, but I want to let you know just briefly, because I am the development director, where we are with fundraising. <laughs> um, this facility right here costs about $14.5 million. This new facility off of the, uh, the main building will cost about four and a half million dollars. Currently, we've raised 13.6 toward the total 19 million dollars that uh, it will cost to, to make these renovations and build these facilities. So we've come a long way. That's all part of phase two uh, of our campaign for Shipley. Um, but we have a ways to go. And um, we hope to close that gap uh, over the next 12 to 14 months. So uh, if you haven't heard from us already, you will likely hear from us very soon um, within that time period. And uh, certainly, <laughs> let me just say that if you have any uh, questions about this or you want to see things in, you know, in person, we'd be happy to take you around and really going into these plans in depth. So please don't hesitate to, to reach out to one of our offices for that. So this is uh, just a, a rendering of uh, one of the new art classrooms. Um, the treatments themselves are not actually accurate at this point because I think some of those have changed along the way, but it gives you a good sense of, of uh, what, the, uh, what the facility will look like. Very bright in the art, in the art rooms. Um, this is a gallery space um, just above the, uh, the new gray box, which is really a, a small performance and conference center, which I'll show you more about that in a second. Um, this is uh, one of the ensemble rooms uh, that we will have as part of the new art center. Um, so we're really excited about the space that this will afford us and the space that it will give us in the new building that we'll be able to renovate. And this is uh, actually, if you recognize uh, this area, this is our current dining hall. And you'll recognize the painting over here on the right and the fireplace, perhaps. Um, but this is now converted into the new, the new multimedia library and academic resource center. And looking back out over the quad, and it's going to be very bright. It'll be a great entranceway for visitors to the school. So we're excited about that possibility. So I just want to share with you a quick animation, and I'll walk you through it. Um, this is middle school on the left. Going down the quad, this is our new dining facility here, the entranceway to the new student commons here. The first floor on the right is the uh, small performance and conference venue that I spoke about. Um, above is the gallery space, you just saw a rendering for that. The skylights are above the, uh, the new art center and the art classrooms. To the right, you have the music classrooms and you also have uh, many offices and uh, portfolio rooms and kiln rooms and practice rooms there as well. 
the solar array atop the building. You also have a spectator, natural spectator area for the baseball games. So now we're back over on Montgomery where you can see other galleries, gallery space. Going west on Montgomery, we'll be going into the new entranceway to the Student Commons and Arts Center. Uh, this will go right into the new parking lot, which will be slightly reconfigured. You see the colonnade here, which will be for drop-off and pickup. Uh, obviously, the students will be able to be undercover <laughs> for that, which is a, a nice feature. To our left is the dining facility. Straight across at the quad is our new uh, library. We'll actually go through the, the entranceway here to the Student Commons now. And as we go through, if we were to go up the stairs to the right, we'd go to the new art center, right over here. But we're going to go into the dining facility. There will also be a school store slash cafe that will be centered there. Um, the dining facility itself um, not only seats more students, uh, but has many more serving uh, capacity. So a lot more serving capacity. So we're able to make it much more efficient and move kids through the process. This is Yarrow Street right here. This is the front of our main building off of Yarrow Street. And uh, just panning around the back of the building, you will see the new library here. And uh, if you can imagine, the current kitchen wing comes out to about here and, uh, and right here. So um, we'll have considerably more green space there as well. Um, so we're really excited about the possibilities of um, you know, project-oriented and collaborative work that will be done there. So, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Todd. Great. So, uh, appreciate that, Chris. So, we'll talk a little bit about progress to date and the schedule. We actually have the next 14 months uh, of uh, project duration mapped out. It's about a 40-page schedule. Uh, so, Steve asked me to kind of narrow that down to a few bullet points as to what's happened to date and what the progress will be in the future. So, so uh, the former Thornbrook Manor site was cleared uh, right after graduation. Sorry about that. Uh, we've created some temporary parking lots. We're thrilled that we're able to actually recreate the parking that we get all of our uh, faculty and staff, all our colleagues uh, on the campus uh, in order to park and not have to utilize off-site parking. Uh, we completed dynamic compactions. We made that around. There was a big weight that we just dropped on the ground to ensure that the building uh, foundation was uh, stable. We did foundation to retain walls, happy to report not out of marshmallows or spaghetti. Masking <laughs> tape. Masking tape. Uh, right now we're doing the underground plumbing. So uh, it was a lot of work. We have several uh, uh, trades on site right now. Um, it, it's very busy and very small site, uh, but it, you know things are going really well from that perspective. And the newest thing is the elevator shaft. So uh, folks have seen the retaining walls go up and say, wow, that's a big building. <laughs> The elevator is coming as well. So uh, as the elevator shaft has gone up, it can really give you some perspective about the height of the building. Uh, it's roughly uh, a little over two stories high uh, due to some of the uh, high ceilings that we have for the art and for the uh, for the dining hall. But it really, I think, you now can get a better understanding about kind of the flow of traffic around the, uh, around the site. So some of our future milestones. Uh, we would like to finish the underground plumbing in November. We are in a race to beat uh, Mother Nature here. That's, that's the goal. Uh, underground electric will be done by January. Uh, structural steel, this is probably be the most uh, important thing that we can get in place is after Thanksgiving, all the steel will show up on site and we'll be flying that in. Uh, that will be very exciting. The building will actually kind of take an erector set uh, uh, look to it and um, I think really build some excitement. And the metal decking, so those two pieces are most critical. We can get those in place uh, before we really hit the, the wrath of, of winter will be in really good shape to meet all of our deadlines. Uh, the curtain walls, so some of the walls on the outside of the building in February and March, and hopefully weather tight in April. And you'll see the roof, rooftop uh, HVAC, I'll just type of their units in April, and our interior fit out for the spring. So jumping more towards the summer, um, as the shell of the student commons is completed, we'll start on the parking lot and reconfigure that all through next summer. We'll concurrently start demolishing the kitchen wing, so there'll be a lot of activity, a lot of inside activity in student commons and exterior activity all throughout the summer. Uh, and the resource center construction really uh, summer and fall of 2015. So the, 
most of the demo work, uh, the goal was to get the existing shelves out of the way and get the external structure built so that we can work on the inside during the school year and minimize a lot of the on-campus disruptions. And the Student Commons will open August 2015, and the Resource Center opens January 2016, if not sooner. And with that, we're going to take you through a quick, I'm hoping this works correctly, right? Uh, quick time-ups. <laughs> this is me playing music, by the way. <laughs> This way, and I just got there. Just talk a little bit about how the moving the art and music into the Student Commons Center will um, help the academic classes that are remaining in the upper school. Thanks. I'm, I'm going to actually thank you for, for asking that. Any anything for Chris and, and Adam in particular? Yes, Miss. So, like the furnishings that are going in the building. Mm -hmm. How, is that something where there's a committee involved with that, or is that already, how's that be? So, uh, it's all Adam, so we're going to blame you. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm smart enough to not make design choices of that nature without bringing uh, a lot of uh, input into it. Uh, we do have a, a resident furniture guru, Joe Walsh, on our physical plant staff, is very uh, forward-thinking in, in terms of some of the, even some of the furniture we've done in the middle school, we've replaced a lot of furniture. Uh, you see a lot more uh, portable furniture. It's worked really well. Uh, so we have Joe and a group of folks from the design team, and also we've had input from both the art and music departments and all of that. So the folks, the end users, have input, and it's a really good collaborative process. So the, you can be confident and I'm not the person doing it. So if you don't plan to ask and get involved with many parents that have any work. There are members involved. of the board of trustees okay. and property committee and others are okay. all involved. Right. So, so great. Other questions? On Thank you, guys. So uh, I love the look of this question, and, and it's actually uh, tied to a lot of different things. But for those who, who don't know the completion of the project, is that uh, and Chris and Adam were good enough to go through the phase that um, takes us through the completion of the library. But off of that, as the library upstairs, the current library in the upper school opens up, it will become four to six new classrooms and office spaces and other which allows us to make what uh, the main building be a full academic center for all of our classes to be able to meet cooperative, collaborative, uh, newer classrooms from a, a multimedia perspective. And yes, the art and the music will be based, and by the way, we didn't speak to it, but there's the gray box, a multi-purpose multi facility that will be the front for both one act plays, Shakespeare, and also some meetings. This is the kind of a meeting that could be there if we choose to do it. What it will do is close the quad, and it will make the focus of the life 
throughout the entire quad in such a way that we will pass, you know, uh, among the different buildings, but at the same time, understanding that the academic focus primarily will be in what is today's main building in all areas, and the art and music will be spoken to as they are, which we think our art and music programs from our perspective are second to none. So having new facilities for them will really make a difference. Does that answer it? Do you want more with that? Or uh, anybody else on that question? Or anything else? So over the next sort of 16 months, for lack of a better you know, term, you'll see continue to see marked growth and improvement. But from our perspective, from a facility perspective, it's really symbolic of, of where the school's going from a program perspective, from a commitment to what our mission is about, to making sure everybody really does understand how process-oriented and committed to excellence we really are. The, the building itself doesn't do that, never will, but it will provide opportunities for increased collaborative and cooperative learning for uh, more interaction across grade levels in ways that we think matter. Share and then joke. Are there any plans um, for the Riley Theater to be used for any of the so, so let me answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> so the, really that question I think is this. Is there ever the prospect that we're going to have a bigger theater, a better theater? The Riley Theater does a great job for 295 people. And honestly, if you were asking me, if there's one of the, the, the two things we'd most like to do coming out of this project would be one, a new theater. One that would seat a greater number of uh, students and college. When we put all of our school together now, or even all, all upper school, we do it in the gym because it's the place where there's sufficient space to be able to do that. So we outgrew Riley Theater, and some people may not know this. Riley Theater was not always a theater. Back in the early 90s, I have somebody who can speak to this. Uh, back in the back in the 60s and 70s, that was a gym. And it was finished over when, the, when quote, the new gym, Yarnell Gym, was built in the early 70s. And so it became a theater. And we've actually looked at the prospect of expanding it, and the, the, the nature of it is it's not possible. So I'll just put it that way. So if you know our campus, you know that in order for us to be able to build a, a new theater or something like it, we need more space. We are landmark. So our hope is that that space will open up in the next couple of years and we'll have the opportunity to purchase a certain apartment building that might be on, <laughs> that might be on the corner of uh, Morris and Montgomery. Um, and down the road, have the possibility of it. Um, but that's, that's one place. And of course, the other piece, which um, we hope will be able to become part of our facility, and it's really fit, still phase three as we get it, is uh, the addition of, a, of, of uh, today's squash courts. We have more students from an athletic perspective in our squash program than any other program. Now, I'm not going to tell you they're all nationally ranked squash players. That's not true. But they're all committed to wanting to learn the game and do the things that we want. Uh, and some people may not know this, but that was once a part of my life in a way that you won't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, and ironically, when I arrived here 20 plus years ago, there were those people who thought the first and only thing we'd ever do was build new squash courts. Well, we don't have them yet. But the game has actually changed. For those who don't know, it's a different size court, and it's something we could use along with improved space to, for dance and other things like that. And that's out there for phase three. But when that will actually turn to product. Did I miss anything on that? Steve, I'll just add that those, those projects are part of a larger master plan. And also part of the master plan are the renovations that we've completed over the last several years that are not part of the campaign per se, but they include the re renovations we did in the main building for the map and history wing. Uh, the renovations, Which made a big difference. Yeah, the renovations in the sphere of the sphere wing um, classrooms. We renovated Yarnell Gymnasium fitness and locker area below uh, Yarnell Gym uh, over this past summer. We've also uh, put on a new turf down here at the lower school. So we have a lot of projects. We will, as the art room space is vacated, renovate those areas as well uh, in the short term. So it's a, it's a it's lot a of moving parts, a lot of balls in the air at once. But um, it's a domino effect. And, and, and if there's one particularly good thing that Chris spoke to that we should clear is one, there really is a plan, right? This isn't just happening. It's not a sort of random piece. And two, it's exciting because uh, we can look out over the next 10 to 15 to 20 years and speak to a school that we know is going to continue to be 
to get better and be committed to getting better. In that context, by the way, and I mentioned it only briefly today, but our board of trustees is just entering into a new strategic planning process that many of you, you know, in fact, anybody who wants to get involved in some level will be able to over the next year plus in terms of focus groups, in terms of concepts, really, I think, reinforcing the school that we are, but always with the eye of integrating the innovation that Margaret's referred to with the quality program and excellence. Jeff. So all of this space that we'll be recovering for incremental classroom space is wonderful. What does that mean for upper school enrollment? Is that an opportunity then to be able to accept 100 more students or 50 more so students? Or? So uh, it, it's a really good question. So when this was originally designed, it was really about liking the school that we are and making it better. It wasn't per se about numbers at all, and it still isn't. We're really at about our cap for what we see as our upper school being. If I put an outside number on, I'd say safely, you might see our upper school get to a maximum of 400 over a period when the facility is, is part, but we're not looking to be any bigger. Than that. We need to be the school that we are, which is about the connection to individual students. Look, at the heart of who we are, we do strictly. Excellence is what it's about. But our belief in getting to excellence is that it revolves around the connections and the relationships, and then the process of really pushing and appreciating our kids in ways that people might not appreciate. So that's it. So I hope I answered that question. There's not a desire in this school to see our upper school grow to be 600 kids or something. No. It really is about holding what we are, but offering the opportunity to be better. Did that, does that yes. answer? And I, I say that in front of uh, Amy, of course, is our director of enrollment management, and, and Margaret, the head of our school. And I can tell you, they both feel that way, and they're both committed to that. And, and, and the board of trustees is committed. So, questions? On that? So let me say this: is this does have some other implications that I want to share. Adam was good enough to uh, share with us the timeline. If you do the timeline, what you recognize is one, that weather matters, and two, timing really matters. And here's what I mean, is that uh, if you lose a week now, it costs you two to three later, is the way it happens with construction. It's just, this was explained to me. I still have, as a math person, I still try to figure out, how does one week now make three weeks left? But they go through the whole thing, but because it, it pushes off all the different time. And the other part of it is, it's making sure that we can open school the way that we need and want to and to have all of our programs go the way we want to. So when we put our calendar together for this year, it was with the belief or the sense at the time that we were moving along fine from the timescape, which we are, uh, but that there wouldn't be constraints with our opening of school or anything like that. Here's what we learned about a month ago, is that in order for us to really make these timeframes work and have our closing events be ones that won't be interrupted by the process in a counterproductive way. <coughs> we made a decision to move the calendar up in essence a week in all three divisions. You'll get a note a little bit later today telling you that upper school graduation, and I use it as the, the end of mark, will actually be on Friday, June 5th instead of Friday, June 12th. Now for those who have been concerned that we always go a week longer than the other schools in the area. It'll make you feel good for one year, right? Right, we do. The other independent schools, we have gone a week longer. It's whatever. We believe we believe that the Friday, um, the second Friday of the month has been a better time to close. Which is actually the third Friday, when the first is the first Friday. But, so we're moving it, I'm just telling you that, we go from the 15th now, usually in terms of when we have graduation, 15th, 14th, 13th, 12th. This will be the first year in many that we will graduate sooner than that. It'll be June 5th. There'll be a similar change, you'll see in the letter, to closing exercises. For those who might be concerned what it actually does to the teaching days, we've actually done it in a way that we close things together, is that you have at most one to two days that are in in terms of the actual teaching point. But all of the closing events have moved up in essence a week. You'll get specifics about those from the people, but I have, only because I have to be looking at, at Tammy as the parent and the senior. So graduation will be Friday the 5th, baccalaureate service will be on Thursday the 4th, Wednesday the 3rd uh, will be uh, classes. Now, 
We would have loved to have known all these things in advance, but we did. Here's the second part, is that when you go to do these things, it isn't simply about our skip. We had to check with all of the other people and facilities that we use to make sure we could still use it. So for example, we use Goodhart Hall over at Bryn Mawr for a number of our events. So we had, it took us a couple of weeks, and then, oh yeah, you can use it here, here, and here. And all. So it's really about putting a puzzle together. And so when we finally got to it, we just finished it, you have a note, an email going out later today, Sue, is it? Uh, talking about this very thing. If you have concerns, don't hesitate to ask. I can tell you is that there are people in the room who have actually written to me in the past about, don't you think you should finish a week earlier? Uh, on the other hand, we still like the calendar the way it's been, and we'll go back to it a year hence. Uh, but that's where we'll be this year. Anybody really chagrined by that? Everybody okay? We hope it's early enough for people to know. Um, questions on the end? Questions on anything else? Yes, sir. Sorry, Sophie. No, I'm happy. Sorry, go ahead. Since I have a senior commencement and an eighth grade, sorry, um, when, just so I can no, here's, here's where it is. Okay. I'll, I'll let Shane answer. But that's like one of the things that we had to you know, make sure that it was doable. So I think that the relationship is actually relatively the same. Shane can tell you when the eighth grade closing is. Tuesday. On Tuesday, the, I'm going to say the second. The second. second. And you'll get a letter sent in all, all those things. Start on Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah, that's how you can see. As somebody who has people in both grades, you can see that. And by the way, if you happen to have also had a fifth grader, which you miss, right? <laughs> we, we, listen, we had to be able to make it work so the closing day in the lower school would work so the Greek day, as we call it, when is that? That's Thursday. Okay, so that's around it. But that's during the day Thursday, not during baccalaureate service, okay? So we need to make sure Steve can also be everywhere. So you can ensure that. It's a remarkable example of innovation. It's a remarkable example of how it's like, you know, it's exciting and it's great. But you can get a sense of what that puzzle looks like so that we can make it work for all of the kids and families the way we think it shows. Right. Questions? Questions on anything else? Any thoughts? How's the start of the year? Uh, yeah, Joe. Uh, I, a first a comment, I thought that the Michelle Moore event was the most amazing Thank event you. we've ever done, the speaker that we've ever had. I enjoyed that so much. Is there any possibility that we would be bringing her back again in a year or two? I thought it was just incredible. So, so, so let me say, is I, I think the world of Michelle Moore, we, Fortunately, we feel fortunate. We, we struck a very good relationship with her. She loves the school. I mean, you heard her say that. She wasn't just saying that. She really believes that. She writes about it. She hears about it. She and Usha have a particular group. She and I are actually have a conversation about, she's in New York a lot. Right. So it's a train ride away and, and, and all about the prospect of having her next spring or the following fall. And she's very excited by the prospect. She's the most sought after person in the country on the topics that she speaks to. But what's really interesting is, is that wherever you hear her, she connects with you. Mm -hmm. And she puts things out there in a way that you really hear it. You know, I, I keep thinking to myself, every time I hear her, I've heard her and every time I how did our children survive? I'm trying to figure out what she talks about the parenting piece. Right. Yeah. She's great. So and thank she's you. so realistic. Well, she is. And um, you know, I think she did, we had a great turnout that night. Fabulous. Lots of people there, and I think everybody felt the same way. And I think we got a lot of good buzz in the community having her. Yeah, so that's why, and listen, it's a much different kind of a presentation, and I don't expect Grant to bring that same level of enthusiasm, but he's the same level person in the area that he's speaking to, which is innovation and, and that kind of stuff. Um, what's, the, what's the title of this book? Edu, Edu, uh, Edu Journey. Edu Journey. Hashtag, hashtag. hashtag Edu Journey. He's a big uh, uh, Twitter person, uh, but uh, it's a wonderful book about innovation and tools, you know, in different places. And you know, the classic thing is that having somebody come in to observe whatever your school is can only be helpful to you, right? And usually, I can say this, you know, we feel pretty good about what they have to say to us afterwards, but we know we can always be better. Always be better. Yeah, Miss. So I want to thank Tim for bringing the upper school varsity students last week to the Halloween gathering because I think it got a little bit of buzz in the lower school. But I would ask at some point for our school to please consider an all school pep rally. An all school pep rally. Yeah, we do the all school. Good old fashioned pep rally. Should we do it for our undefeated football team? 
Yes, we yes. could include the undefeated football team. And I, would, so I would ask that we try to consider that at some point in time because my children have never experienced that. And it was something that it's I grew up that I very much enjoyed. We don't have to have cheerleaders. I'm not advocating cheerleaders. I'm just saying. No, 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 first of all, wait, some people are, hold on, hold on. We have had cheerleaders. Uh, uh, Sharon Russell, actually, I'm not pushing that necessarily, but the, val the, val the balance of it is, you know, the concept is, is something for us to think about. Uh, the timing of the things is what really makes it a challenge at times, because normally you put together a pep rally around really big games, um, which is a great thing to do. The hard part is you don't know, because of the way the schedule is going, when those are necessarily going to happen. And there are actually people in the school who think that academics come first. Right. So the moment, I, I don't mean that, I said it. There are actually, so in the moment when we go to change the schedule, if you ask our division heads, what if faculty, what if colleagues, you know, and it's understandable because they have classes scheduled, they have this schedule, what do they get most concerned about? When they lose teaching time for whatever it is. So it's a balance. So it's a good idea. We can look at it. That's actually how we grew to the uh, to doing four all school assemblies, which we, for me, Honestly, selfishly, Sue will tell you this. My favorite thing of the year, all the time, is to have all the kids together in a real place. Did you want to say? No, I want to sneeze. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say this other, other, other comments or questions? Listen, have, have people gotten the links to the survey, to the parent survey? Please take the time. You know, I think it's about a 20 minute process. Uh, Kevin, um, uh, Kevin Graham, who is the uh, Overseas Lookout Management actually is the principal of it. Uh, we'll be here in the spring to provide feedback on, you know, we're doing this actually with four constituencies. We're doing it with our parents, of course, we're doing it with our kids, we're doing it with our colleagues, and we're doing it with our alums. That part will wait a little bit later in the year, Chris, am I right? This spring. So he won't have that report when he comes back in the spring, but he'll come in and share thoughts, and I think it will be a great thing. One or two other questions or comments on anything? Is the story of the year going okay for me? Uh, we appreciate it. We love having your kids. I mean, the, the school for me, you know, still always will be first and foremost about them. And, you know, our commitment to really challenge each of them and appreciate each of them. And at the same time, let them know what it means to strive for and achieve excellence. But at the same time, learn how to do both well and to do good. This is a school that's going to be about reaching out into the community. It's just fundamental to what we believe is important. Along with, of course, achieving all the things you want to achieve on a personal level. So it's important. Questions? Thanks for taking the time this morning. I hope you have a great day. Oh, I'm sorry. Just, will this still be a play day in lower school? Still a play day. Yeah, what we've done is, how could we end the year without a play day? Uh, they may have to recite Cicero on that day. Yeah, no. Yeah, no we, what we've done is to take the schedule and, yeah, well, yeah, well, uh, there is some date, you know, part. But yeah, the, as you know, in essence, all of the events that have always taken place will take place. They'll just be moved up. If you want to know where it's really craziest, it's it, it, orchestrating these things a week earlier is much more complicated than anybody can even imagine. Not just in terms of locations, but getting letters out, doing it's it's like you just never know until you're in the place. But if you have any questions or comments, don't hesitate. You will get that email later today, and we'll be all set. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Have a great day. Thanks for being here. Trav, thanks for doing that. Good early. Right, I have to worry about the key. I like to check out the Okay. 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 Okay.